well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kelsey Jagard, and I work here at YYC Growers and Distributors. Um, and I'm a settler in Treaty 7, which is a traditional territory of the Gainai, the Gani, the Zika, Kitsuna, and Sony Dakota Wesley Bears Bomb to Making Nations, uh, and the Métis Nation of Region 3. I'd just like to acknowledge these groups. Uh, we wouldn't be able to farm or produce any food on the stolen land without their ongoing stewardship and resiliency and their ongoing cultural knowledge. So as we head into this weekend, I'd invite you to think about how you're going to show up for the land and nurture your relationship with it and give back to it in any way that you can. Um, but thank you for joining us. So if you have never been to a YMC Growers Education session before, Welcome. Um, these are focused on helping Calgarians and those in the UK, apparently, um, connect to food systems and the people behind it. So we've never heard of YYC Growers and Distributors. We're a farmer-owned cooperative that works to ensure local, fresh, and nutrient-dense food gets to Calgary and the southern Alberta area. And all of our food comes from southern Alberta and a couple from BC and Saskatchewan. So we're committed to supporting those local economies and those local food systems. Um, if you'd like more information, you can visit yycgrowers.com to learn more. Uh, I also have a discount code for people at the end if you're a new subscriber. Um, and I'll share that in the chat at the end. So stay tuned. Um, but today I'm joined by Rod Olson from Leaf and Liar Urban Farm and YYC Growers. And I'm very excited. So how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. <laughs> Good. Um, and how about you... Introduce yourself. We're going to be talking about regenerative agriculture. We'll get to you in a second. But first, who are you? Yeah, I'm Rod Wilson. I uh, grew up in Treaty 6 territory, uh, but uh, I've made Calgary my home since uh, 2005. And uh, <clears throat> shortly after kind of arriving in Calgary, I was working on a master's degree uh, and taking care, yeah, being the kind of the primary caregiver from, for our two daughters um, and I ran upon this website called spinfarming.ca um, and I, I grew up as, as a farm kid uh, and I, I was quite inspired by the fact that that you could take urban urban land um, in people's backyards uh, and and re well turn it back into agricultural production and so I started a company leave and Liar, in 2010 with my brother-in-law Chad and uh, proceeded to kind of take these backyards and uh, grow vegetables on them and then pass them on to, to restaurants in Calgary. Um, yeah, and build, build kind of a sense of community and, and connection to some of those yard owners. Barbara Bond, who's on the call today, is, was one of those. Um, and uh, yeah, so, that, so that's kind of a little bit of history. Um, and then maybe it, what got me kind of cued into, into taking this regenerative egg um, journey uh, was, you know, growing things in Barbara's yard versus Jean's yard. I'd grow the same thing and uh, I'd, I'd get two totally different results. And, uh, and so that, that's kind of what launched me into trying to figure out if there's something deeper going on. Um, and, uh, and that deeper is definitely kind of what's going on in the soil. And so really started to kind of geek out on, on soil and uh, what the, the capacity of the soil is for nutrient density, uh, all the things that you talked about earlier, uh, Kelsey. So, so yeah, so been, been kind of on that journey, um, did the Graham Sate, um, he has a program called the nutrition certified nutrition farmer, uh, program. And so it really takes a look at nutrition, uh, and, and how to, how farmers can, can maximize that in, in the soil ecosystem, the living ecosystem of the soil, uh, so that our food is as nutritious as possible. Nice, good answer. Um, and what's your connection to YYC Growers? Yeah, so back in 2013, uh, was a urban farmer and uh, kind of connecting with a couple other urban farmers uh, at that time. And we were kind of commiserating a little bit as farmers tend to do. And I was just saying, there's got to be a way to, to kind of pool some of the resources, reduce some of our overhead costs. And so we kind of dreamed up this idea of kind of creating a, a society or a, a group that we were calling at that time, YWC Metro Growers. Um, and uh, that quickly, you know, with the help of Dennis from originally uh, the Dirt Boys Farmer, 
um, really kind of took that and snowballed it into uh, becoming a cooperative. And so, yeah, so we signed on as a cooperative in 2017. And, and so I'm one of those originating farmers that, that, uh, that helped build YWC growers. Well, Rod's an OG guy. OG. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about regenerative agriculture today. Um, so first off, uh, I know it's a very, very big question, a very broad question, but what is regenerative agriculture? I, I'm going to just share one photo here. I guess I could present. Um, and yeah, a lot of times people like it's it, regenerative agriculture might be a little bit of a buzzword. Um, and if you're following the news at all, you know that uh, General Mills is behind it. Pepsi is now behind it. Uh, Danone is is kind of involved in it. Uh, and, you know, and then there's those of us that are kind of on the grounds and, you know, interacting with this ecosystem itself. And so so there's there's a, there's a wide range of kind of understandings. But but this list, um, if you've seen anything around agroecology um, that often happens more in the institutional realm biodynamics we have uh, blue mountain biodynamic just north of calgary organic permaculture lots of permacultures and perm permies in calgary um, even conventional can be regenerative um, cage-free grass-fed non-gmo uh, so so those are just a bunch of of words that that fit into the bucket of regenerative agriculture um, but the way that I like to talk about regenerative agriculture is that it's first and foremost uh, a shift in mindset. And uh, that mindset is one from extraction to uh, partnership. Uh, oftentimes I talk about the soil being, being you know, part of your farming company. Like it's, it might be the, the board chair of your, of your company. And every farmer knows that soil is there, is there highest resource and so this is why I think conventional can actually make it to the list um, because even conventional farmers know that soil is their is their top um, resource uh, and so what they need to do you know anything that they can do to kind of protect that resource um, I think be, is on the trajectory of regenerative agriculture um, and so that that mind sh mindset shift really is founded on uh, changing your approach from one that just takes mines the resources of the soil uh, to get a product at the end of the day. And uh, so, yeah, that's number one, mindset shift. And I think number two in my definition of, of regenerative agriculture is that it, it's actually a collection of indigenous practices. Uh, so it doesn't matter, you know, so regenerative agriculture is a global movement uh, and it doesn't matter where you are on the globe, uh, but there are regenerative practices from that location that have developed over centuries uh, how to live in part in harmony with with nature and so you know regenerative egg kind of gets a bad rep reputation because sometimes it, it says it's these list of practices that uh, that don't have any connection to their origin and so let you you heard it here first that uh, I very much see and know that it is regenerative uh, or that it's indigenous practices that they kind of we're, we're, we're leaning on in terms of understanding um, uh, regenerative agriculture. So I'm just going to get one more picture to kind of visually show uh, one more side of regenerative egg. Um, just bear with me two seconds. Whoops, I need to share it now. <laughs> this is always better when Kelsey's asking the questions, but here we go. So regenerative agriculture um, again, <laughs> is responding to, to this de degradation in our ecosystem. And so where we are currently um, is in a degraded landscape. Um, if, you, if you study kind of systems theory, um, water cycles, nitrogen cycles, you know, the ocean acidification conversation, like it's, it, we're kind of in a, in a pretty depressing time in, in the history of the world. Um, and so we are, we, we've, we've kind of degenerated the, the, uh, the environment. So a lot of like 
there's been a lot of talk about sustainability. And what I'm here to say is that regenerative re regeneration is not sustainability. And so if we were to sustain uh, where we are right now, we would, we would still be progressively kind of getting worse. And so that's why um, what we need to be doing is, is thinking about the ecosystem in a way that we are giving, constantly giving back to that ecosystem. And so for me, that's this, this idea of re regeneration. Um, you know, can we, can we leave the place better than when we found it? Um, so, yeah. And then the, the, the final part of that definition is that, is that there's, it's a, it's a group of practices, uh, like a list of practices, um, so from everything from keeping the soil covered to kind of putting, um, compost on to like having per perennial roots in the system, um, which helps with the, the building soil, uh, animals in the, you know, so that their, their biology really kind of can help. Um, increase the the ecosystem recovery as well um, so yeah so it again like you said very complex maybe you can sum that up Kelsey <laughs> yeah so I think uh, and it's something we talk about a lot here while I was here is regenerative agriculture and helping our farmers take that first step so there is this big massive list of regenerative practices like there's you know farming and like agroforestry and all these things and it's a massive list for farmers to look at and kind of get overwhelmed with. So even just taking those first little steps or choosing a practice that works for our farmers that we get our food from here at YYC Growers is something that we're working on. Um, and something that Rob touched on as well is regenerative agriculture, first and foremost, is about reciprocity. So there's this kind of like take culture from the land um, and actually realizing that as we're taking things from the land, if we're not giving anything back to help it grow, um, it's not going to be there for us. So it is a relationship with the land. And I think the more we move towards actually good practices that are in regenerative agriculture, um, that again, will, will boost that reciprocity. So leaving those roots in the ground is thinking about all those bacteria that need those to survive and not just thinking about our own kind of take that we can keep kind of divulging from the earth. Um, so Jacob, or sorry, Jade, Jaco, 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 wow, really doing good with names here. Um, she's asking, are you partnering with an Indigenous community for that Indigenous connection definition at all? Yeah, so one of my in, um, inspirations in the regenerative space, space for the Indigenous perspective, uh, well, there's a couple. Um, one is Reginaldo Haslat Maske. He's, uh, he lives currently in uh, Minnesota. Uh, but but a very powerful voice in terms of the in, indigeneity of regenerative agriculture. Uh, and then another one is Chris Newman, who is currently writing a book. Um, he kind of followed the Joel Salatin back to the land. Um, and so he himself is, is indigenous and black and has a very fascinating perspective on on, on that. Um, one of the things that, that we need to keep in mind here in, in uh, Treaty 7 is that uh, it's a largely um, a foraging uh, cu culture. You know, so we've heard of things like the Three Sisters Gardens, uh, which takes different plants like corn, beans, and squash um, and puts them all together in one patch. And they, they do this mutual benefit thing, which, which is typically kind of from uh, Ontario. Uh, or, yeah, sorry, a little bit of, a little bit of noise here. Um, so, so yeah, and then I, I do partner personally on an, on another community part project with a couple elders um, from Pigani. Um and uh, yeah, so lots of uh, lots of kind of conversation for me personally. Um, does regenerative egg do a great job of partnering with the indigenous? I think they're they're learning on it, or they're they're learning to do that more. Yeah, if you want to put the title of those like authors and, and books in the chat room. Yeah, so the, the book is actually... Um, is this one you sent me that's not published? It's, it's not published. So if you pay Patreon $5, I think you can get the chapters as they are released. And it's like, if you want to feel uncomfortable, it's it's a great, um, a great thing. So if you Google Chris Newman um, on Patreon, you would find it. The, the name of the book is is uh, not in my language and so i'm not going to be able to say that name um but teresa if, well maybe while we're chatting um yeah. I'll, I'll maybe find it 
Yeah, and I think that is a thing too, especially as we're talking about regenerative agriculture and practices that are coming from other communities and peoples. It is really important to make sure that is acknowledged. Um, and like Rod said, reading something that makes you uncomfortable as a farmer, I don't think often happens very much. Um, so I think having a different idea of the land itself, um, but then also how we came to be on the land is, is another big part of actually working towards regenerative agriculture and working towards being a better person who's just kind of taking up space in this place. Um, cool. So, uh, Oh, Sarah found it already. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so there's just some stuff in the chat there. Um, and so I guess my next question for you, Rod, is what gets you super excited about regenerative agriculture? I know you mentioned you're a geek, so, um, but what gets you like really jazzed? Uh, <laughs> apologies for what may come, come here. No, um, I think the biggest the biggest thing that gets me excited, and, and this has kind of been coloring the work that we do here at, at YYC Growers, um, back in January of 2020, before the pandemic hit, uh, we, we collected all of the farmers and we had a meeting together. And and, uh, and one of the things that I was, was talking with them about in terms of us as a cooperative and, uh, is that what we really need to do is kind of model ourselves around this idea of a super organism. Um, and so, a superorganism is like the termites who have been around since, you know, before the, the dinosaurs. And so something about the dinosaur age collapsing um, showed that the dinosaur as a system, as a creature, was not resilient, was not something that could weather the storms that were that were coming. Whereas these termites, ants or, or whatever, um, were constructed in such a way that they were resilient. Um, and so... I think as, as we think about kind of this, this current stage that we're in, you know, eco grief is something that I think we all carry, uh, even if we haven't named it. And so what is it about um, the natural world that can actually teach us how to be resilient in this time? And so I think for me, I think that's the biggest, um, uh, that's what I get most excited about because I feel like I'm a big transformation kind of junkie as well. I think we as, as human people, are, are really co capable of incredible things. Um, the problem is that we, our ego and the, some of the, the, the structures that we kind of have created get in the way of that. Um, so if we actually look to the soil um, and the, the, the living ecosystem that, the, that is the soil, um, it, it gives us such a, an incredible metaphor for how we can operate. Um, and I guess when, when I say we, um, I love, I love the fact that, that there's multiple languages. I mean, English, going back to Latin, um, for humus and human um, being the same root. So this sense of humility that is the human person. Um, it's in Greek. Uh, it's in Hebrew. I studied some ancient Hebrew. But Adam and Adama. Adam is like human. Adama is earth. And so it's like you can hear the this, this similarity. Um, and so I think there's a lot that, that we can learn from actually understanding the the soil as a as a system and so i think that's what gets me most excited and and you know to kind of maybe bring it to bring it back to home or into into you, you as an individual person um microbes um are um are kind of the the building block of of the soil microbes and fungi um kind of the, this found like this base layer and microbes are actually responsible for nutrition in your plant. And so if you want boron or selenium or molybdenum in your plant, you need to have a microbe that that's its job. And so microbes, like the, the boron microbe is just elated to be his boron microbe self. He's like living his true purpose and he's pumping that boron as much as he can into the plant, relying on a little bit on this mycorrhizal network of, of you know, connection that can get that boron if he's maybe doesn't have it right next to him, uh, but he's happy. He's doing the thing. And when he's happy doing the thing, uh, he's not worrying about the selenium microbe or the molybdenum microbe. They're, they're over there doing their same thing. And so I just think, you know, Roger, Teresa, Rose, Carmela, like when you dip, you know, sink into your deepest purpose, that thing that maybe terrifies you, 
and you do it, you do it with joy and purpose, like a, this sense of fullness of purpose. That's, <laughs> I, I guess that's what I, what I see is this capacity. Like if we can figure out human humus and then live the way that the soil lives, I just, I get crazy um, excited about what that can mean for us as the human species. <laughs> Sorry. Amen. Wow. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that is a thing too, like the, the systems that are in the soil and again, being able to, to feed our plants. It's like they're made for each other and they're made to work together and, and build up the soil and build up food. And so again, like, us giving back and figuring out how we make sure that still happens because they're feeding us. And that is that we are a closed loop system. And I think that has to be remembered <laughs> more often than not. Um, but I know you're talking about like scientists talk about like it takes like a hundred years for an inch of like topsoil to develop. Um, what is regenerative agriculture doing for that? Uh, I'm also very excited. So I get out, I get out of my kind of metaphor world, and the pra the pragmatics of uh, regeneration are are equally exciting, um, and and so and we actually have Sarah and Marcus uh, on the on the call today. Uh, I love to tell their story because they bought their farm uh, and they had zero point five percent soil organic matter, and so that's kind of the top layer of the really good stuff, um, and they had a twenty five year plan to kind of boost that up to 10 to 15 percent uh, well it was I think three or four years uh, they're doing a very intensive kind of cattle chicken rotation on their on their grassland and they have already seen a they've already seen their 10 to 15 percent soil organic matter in three to four years um, and so I think that's that is the 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 the, the, the the capacity of the soil and and scientists are are really starting to to showcase the fact that what what they thought was going to be a 20 year process can actually happen in th three to five years uh, when you have a dedicated steward a dedicated farmer uh, who is like gunning for that as as its outcome and and really it, it, so it really does become uh, i can't remember which president it was that says you know wh whatever you measure you can no <laughs> metrics measure. Somebody knows the quote. Um, yeah, there you go. Sarah says three years of grazing, um, and so so I think that that's that's you know, and soil organic matter is is that is that layer where all of that transpiration, uh, like respiration, um, the protection of you know from soil erosion is is built in that, protect, particularly in kind of the grass kind of situation where that root mat is also there to protect the soil. Um, but then there's there's just this carbon exchange that is that is happening on on that on that land. And, and I think that that's that's what we what we want to see happen. Um, yeah, so so building soil. Um, and then there was a farmer in Saskatchewan um, who did build this inch of soil, not in the hundred years that scientists say, but in 10 years. Um, and again, doing this this kind of grassland um, management with with cattle and, and that sort of thing. I mean, and then the spinoff with with uh, with that guy is that he uh, he also kind of reactivated springs, and so we actually work at YWC Growers with KC from Fishburn Fishburn Ranch uh, for some of our beef, uh, and he too has also seen some ancient species that are returning into that that ecosystem that people thought were were no longer viable, uh, but because the cattle have actually been operating a little bit like bison, um, the way that he's managing them these ancient species are, are starting to return. And so, so there, there's just a ton of uh, excitement globally of, of around the capacity that regenerative ha agriculture has to, to kind of reverse climate change, increase water capa holding capacity um, and that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's like the thing with like those ancient uh, plants coming back. It's just like that symbiosis. They're just like starting to mm -hmm. remember what it was like to have their hooped friends around in a way that actually, again, is that relationship that is giving back to their right that value. reciprocity that you talked mm -hmm. about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so we know that this is exciting. It sequesters carbon. Um, it's again like bringing back species. It's really healthy for the ecosystem. Um, but there's a lot of people who are on the fence about it. So what's holding people back from kind of jumping on board with this? It's so exciting and doing everything that we just talked about. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, 
I actually was just listening to John Kempf. Uh, and if people don't know that name, um, he has a podcast advancing A E something. Advancing anyhow, advancing regenerative egg or something like that. Uh, and he was talking about uh, the fact that like he, he works kind of in the Massachusetts area. And he was actually talking about peer pressure being one of the, the reasons that farmers don't get into it. Um, because, you know, what happens when you head down to the local coffee shop and you're, you're, you're the crazy guy that's doing these weird things. Um, and I think even Sarah and Marcus might be able to speak to that truth, truthfully, like, um, they, they're, they're very focused on, on this, this, uh, uh, this journey. And, uh, and so I think that's one of them. Uh, and, and, and so one of the things that we, we play here at YRC Growers is actually creating that demand uh, so that, that more farmers are going, oh, like there's, a, there's an army of people in Calgary that want to eat food that, that heals the earth, that has more nutrition than they can get from the grocery store uh, and, you know, supports their local economy. And so, so like that's one of the, the games that we love playing at YRC Growers is like we need more, we need, we need more eaters to kind of send a message to those farmers that say, yeah, this is, this is the way that we want you to grow. And I think once farmers know that they can sell, um, uh, then, then uh, they're much more motivated to kind of grow a, according to those specifications. And that's actually, sorry, a side note, I did call it myself a geek, but you know, when you look at the history of agriculture, um, we think maybe it happened and then they've been putting it in. But since the beginning, it was like, groups of people would get together and they're like oh hang on a second we need we need food and so they would send people out to kind of do that food production um and i feel like regenerative egg has that same kind of historical impulse where where we as a as a collective in society can signal to the farmers that this is actually how we want you to grow that food and and uh, and so i think we as as consumers customers have a lot of power in in this conversation um and then so what is the most important thing businesses and individuals can do to make the biggest positive impact uh, and support regenerative egg? I know we just talked about we're trying to create an army of regenerative egg. They call them regenerative egg nights. <laughs> that, that thing. Um, but how do people get on, on this train and, and make sure that they're supporting um, this regenerative agriculture movement? Yeah, thanks for that question. And uh <clears throat> that one came in, I think, through Instagram. So I've been thinking about that one a lot, and uh, and as you can tell, I I can I have a tendency to just go on. Um, and so, w what I came to though is is that if if you were to switch um, your business, uh, your individual practices to seasonal eating, um, I think that that would actually solve just a ton of issues, kind of with one one small shift. Uh, and so, because seasonality is, I mean, you're going to ask, actually have to ask questions about what grows here and what grows here when. Um, seasonality also means that that you have to kind of shift what you eat. Do you are you really going to eat asparagus in December? Uh, well, if you're eating seasonally, no, you're not. Um, or seasonally and locally, I guess, what can be sourced locally. And so we just came through um, asparagus fiddlehead season. Um, so, so much, um, and it's like. I, I mean, I love those moments because I, I feel like I get to, uh, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a nostalgic human. And, and so there's these moments where I feel like oh, I'm part of the, the trajectory of he, the, the course of humanity. You know, if, if, if the indigenous, you know, did a buffalo hunt, th there'd be a lot of buffalo being eaten at that time. And so like right now, a lot, lot of asparagus being eaten. Uh, and it just, it, it kind of makes me feel like I'm super connected to to, to this place um, and what the gifts this place are, are giving. Um, so I think that's, that's, that would be my biggest, um, uh, my biggest kind of encouragement for, for businesses and, uh, and, and people. And then I think that the second one is, is to kind of think in terms of this kind of gets to my first point of regenerative agriculture is, is think, think of your life um, as a, as a system and, you know, what can you do to become net zero? Um, and so like, that's, that's, that, kind of gets under the idea of, of getting, well, get, getting the mindset right. Uh, and so if you, you were to think about you as a human, 
your house, your your eating, like your vehicle, like how can all of the, all of those systems be net zero? And that's kind of the same uh, impulse that our farmers are are working with. You know, they they're trying to reduce um, kind of the the greenhouse gas emissions, if that's one metric that you want to use. Uh, and they're they're trying to increase their their contribution back into the into the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think another thing to um, another point that we talked about with Michael actually a couple weeks ago was covering your soil. Um, Again, if we're talking about that reciprocity, like I would hate to put my grandmother out in the sun without an umbrella over her. She would burn and she'd get really bad, she'd get really bad sunburn. So if you're gonna think about your soil in the same way and looking after those critters that are under the soil, as we have these increased temperatures of climate change, um, it's making sure that we're also doing our best to kind of protect them as well. So covering your soil, you can do that with um, mulch or you can do that with straw. Um, and that just kind of keeps them cool in the ground and be able to do what they are supposed to be doing and not worry about this kind of increased temperature that we're forcing upon them um, from the from our kind of human realm. Um, but yeah, and then there were some other ones that you have on here, Rod, like composting and uh, repurposing waste and adding that back into your soil is super important. Um, there's one here as well, and I know this is like a big one for a lot of um, kind of conventional farmers, this idea that they have to ditch all the chemicals that they're using um, because then it just seems like, I don't know, it seems like a big issue for a lot of them. Yeah, well, and actually, I mean, if I can speak to that a little bit, um, one of the, I mean, that ends up being the biggest, um, the biggest economic drivers for kind of conventional systems. Uh, so there's an organization in the States called Farmers Footprint uh, that was set up by Dr. Zach Bush. Uh, and the, the idea behind the, the foundation was to, to collect, um, collect money, to raise money so that they could help farmers transition from a chemical driven agriculture system to to a regenerative one um, and so the the way I understood it and maybe things have changed since since I learned about it but they they were to uh, you know let 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 the farmers footprint uh, which is a beautiful website and there's some videos and, and I, like if you want to go down a, a beautiful farmer kind of journey go check that one out um, but they would sit down with the farm and go well, what was your what was your kind of average income in the last couple of years and they would promise that income to the farmer for the next three years um, so that the the farmer knew that that there was no risk to him in doing you know engaging in this transition and this is where I don't know if it's completely factual but but the stories that I was told is is the fact that no farmer actually dipped into that fund because right from the beginning, that first year, they were they were making more money than they ever had, and and the biggest biggest issue there is your chemical uh, inputs. Um, those are they're incredibly expensive, um, and at the end of the day, um, those chemicals actually are are slowly degrading the the soil aggregates, and so like it, yeah, so de- degrading the soil aggregates and creating like the pesticides actually create more problem. Um, it, which is which is kind of mind boggling, but if you actually looked at pesticide sales, it's always increasing. So obviously, it's not a solution that that works. You know, so like doing the same thing that gets you the wrong is is the definition of crazy. And and so I think that's why when farmers do the transition, get rid of the chemicals, uh, they're already seeing an economic benefit. Um, and then there's then there's a bunch of like as you mentioned earlier, a lot of practices. And management change changes that, that need to kind of be adopted to kind of then support uh, the journey into regenerative agriculture. Mm-hmm. And then um, another thing as well, I think when you're saying those farmers found that they didn't have to use any pesticides and stuff, I'm assuming they started planting a more biodiverse type of plant base. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so one way of doing that as well with regenerative agriculture is kind of moving away from that monocropping system. Um, and having a bunch of biodiversity because there's pollinators that are going to come in and um, with the pollinators, there's going to be more insects. It's just building up that soil um, and making sure that you have a thriving ecosystem that um, despite your farmer's field, maybe your neighbor's field, when they've been using all of these chemicals that have been killing their soil repeatedly um, and having like just across the road, having this like beautiful patch of, of land that is this ecosystem and so i think you can see the difference in a lot of practices 
Um, and if anyone's ever watched Kiss the Ground, I'm sure you all have the documentary on Netflix. Um, but there's a farmer on there that you can see the distinct difference between him and his neighbor's plot of him just using regenerative practices and the benefits of having that ecosystem kind of come back to life, which is, which is awesome. Um, but for supporting local agriculture and local regenerative agriculture, um, one thing that we always try to promote here at YWC Growers is purchase from our farmers. Um, we're a bit of a hub here where we have done our research on all of our growers that we bring in and all of their practices and making sure that they're not degrading to the environment and they're not on that decline like Rachel with those pictures of the grass there. Um, so making sure that we screen people who are coming in and we've been creating these growing and raising practices for um, both the animals um, but also the, the food and plants as well. So and keeping that and, and introducing that to our farmers who don't, who are kind of on the fringe of regenerative agriculture and starting to bring them in with just one practice at a time until it slowly kind of grows. So um, if you're looking again, like how can we support regenerative agriculture is buy from farmers who are doing the right thing. And that's something that we're trying to commit to is, is making it very easy for you to find those farmers who are, who are doing that good work and making sure that they are covering the soil and making sure that it's healthy and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, and also for those of you who aren't subscribers yet, who would like to subscribe, um, I'm going to give you that promo code now. So um, it's just YYC Education, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, and if you would like to subscribe, we have weekly or bi-weekly um, boxes that we commit to to pull from these really great farms that are doing this good work um, and getting it onto your plate every week or bi-weekly, completely up to you. We have some um, some meat that's coming in as well. That's from Casey at Fishburne Ranch, for example, who's, who's seen those ancient kind of plants come back, which is really awesome. Um, and just making sure that we're trying to tell that story of what's happening and what farmers are seeing on their land from doing these awesome practices. Um, but yeah, so I'm just gonna open it up to any questions. So if you wanna unmute yourself, feel free. If you wanna type it in the chat, 10 minutes, so pick his brain, pick it, pick it good. <laughs> One of the things as people are getting more energy for their questions going, that I think is one of the greatest things that you can do as well to kind of support regenerative agriculture is actually grow your own food. Uh, and then you actually use, you, It'll open your eyes to weather like you've never been opened to, um, yeah, the kind of the pests, the cycles of, of life uh, and what it takes to actually nurture life in, in another being, like a, a plant being. A friend being, yeah. Um, cool. Well, nobody has any questions. Does anyone just want to say hi to Rod? We haven't seen Rod in a while. He wants to just say hi, Rod. Oh, the started to work a question. I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, because I'm actually at work, I've kind of had to listen to this with uh, with half an ear. So. Um, I appreciate the resources that are in the chat, but. Um, Um, the podcast for John Kempf, so K-E-M-P-F, uh, and that one does go in, into things a little bit more scientifically um, because he wanted a, a place to do a bit of a deep dive around the, the actual science. Um, but super fascinating. Um, we're actually really inspired by John Kempf as well because he's developing this thing called the bio nutrient, like an app that you put on your phone you can go to the grocery store and zap a bag of carrots and it'll come back with a reading of, of the nutrient density of that carrot and uh and so we're we we know that that once that kind of gets all um uh, what's the word um ratified finished uh it's going to be a massive game changer in the in the ag space um but yeah 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's and the other one that was the Sarah put in the chat to you was uh, she just followed Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. So if you want to go there, tweet it's just regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm copying everything into a Word document, so I have it for later. So nice. it's been a really interesting topic. Thanks, Rod. Yeah, you're welcome. And um, I, I there's will... a question from Barbara in here too. Um, so Barbara's asking, is there someone that can soil, <laughs> or is there like a? So we talked about this. Um, a couple weeks ago which with Michael Gavin as well, which we, was really funny. Someone actually brought him out to his her garden on the last cop and was like, What about this? And like showed him, which is pretty funny. We all we all just need Rod and, and Michael on speed dial. Um but yeah, is there anyone in the city of Calgary that is that <laughs> Barbara, I'm happy to come over. Um, and 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 that is something that we I'm actually working with the University of Calgary. Um, in their soil department. So it's a little bit of a pet project side project that I have around, you know, actually doing some research uh, to get baselines of soil data from all of our farms. Um, and one of the reasons I'm doing that is is to then really empower urbanites because we oh. have a lot of acreage in Calgary. So what? No way. Where? What? Beruni. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and so yeah. So and then we want to empower people like yourself, Barbara, to, to kind of actually jump. Sometimes it does take uh, a bit of cash infusion, which uh, you know, to get a soil test, um, which then it really helps us know what we're working with. Um, and so actually we're, we are doing a bunch of soil testing with our farms to uh, future analytics in Red Deer. Uh, and so maybe maybe it's something that I could help coordinate some of the, some urban backyards to kind of get involved in, in our data collection that we're doing. So if you're interested in that, Barbara, then we'd, we'd be happy to, to kind of get that happening. And then once I've got a kind of a readout of uh, your soil data, then it's super easy to kind of intuit um, what needs to happen. Um, and then, Julian, if you want to, Julian's asking me if you could put the slide up. I think it's the first slide that you shared that has all the different, like, types of farming that fit into a regenerative egg. You bet. Um, and while you're doing that, um, Jade also just asked, um, so one of the biggest barriers uh, you think of Growing the urban farming movement, ooh, it's growing slowly. But. Yeah, and Jade, we get, we get to have a, a deeper conversation on this right after this. Um, but <laughs> but um, I, I think well, one of the biggest barriers that has been is is actually access to to doing the agriculture, um, and so getting land. Um, is, is a huge barrier to any kind of agriculture. Um, so, I mean, I started just, we ended up being on CBC and, and kind of reaching out to Cal Calgarians. And, and there are a lot of Calgarians that are like, yeah, sure, come and take my take, take my backyard. Um, those, those Calgarians also take the yards back because they realize, hey, I can grow beautiful food myself. Um, that was sort of a comment to Barbara. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, like, what I actually have seen is that there's, there's real work to kind of reduce those barriers. Um, you know, so the city of Calgary has got public land that they're willing to kind of give. Um, and, and then YWC growers, like we really do support new farmers uh, because we can take all of the stuff that you grow um, in one kind of fell swoop. So, whereas typically a, a, an urban farmer, you know, they're learning how to do soil science collection. They're, they're learning, you know, how to, how the growing conditions for each of the plants, um, you know, and, and depending on how many plants you grow, that's like having a relationship with that many different individuals because they all have different needs and different growing conditions and, and soil conditions. Uh, and so like, that's a huge learning curve. And then, um, and then an urban farmer typically also is, is trying to get set up at a farmer's market um, and doing that sort of thing. So you, you, there it's, I think we're in a, in a place in society where we've really kind of niched our skills. Um, and the farmer generalist is, is maybe, you know, kids don't see that as a, as an example to follow. And so like, I would say the biggest barrier is that kind of that sense of entrepreneurship, uh, that will 
know, the city of Calgary is supporting it. YBC Growers is supporting kind of the marketing and sales end of it. And so, so really the, the barrier is, is people that want to actually take that risk. Um, and when I, and, you know, we do have a brand new farmer this year and, and he is kind of wide eyed every time he comes in to, to deliver uh, just because there's so many layers of things going on. Um, and so I think, yeah, so, and that, and that for me, that's a bit of a passion um, is, is actually trying to help people kind of learn the skills and, and, and not just, you know, the, you know, gardening in grandma's backyard, but, but the, the production farming and, and what, what's required in that. Um, so does that answer the question, Jade? <laughs> Yeah, that was excellent. Thank you. And then here's, Jolene, here's the slide. Yeah, and I think uh, that's the thing too that saying. So we have these like new urban farmers that are, are coming in. Hours or a whole afternoon at a farmer's market, going there, setting up and paying for that table to be there. Um, Literally, they can just roll up to us on Tuesday, like place orders with them and stuff, but they'll roll up to us on Tuesday, literally drop it, be like, cool, I gotta go back, I gotta keep farming. And so being able to have that kind of support for them, um, where we can take, even if they only have 10 of one thing or five of one thing, um, being able to support them in, in taking that on, um, I think is something that I feel really good about with working here, is knowing that we're kind of supporting the people who um, have can't really afford those like massive operating costs that do come with a lot of farmers markets. Awesome. Um, Santa would like to have a deeper conversation, um, but wants to find a place where she fits. So what do you mean by that? Sir? Deeper conversation about regenerative agriculture or? Santa's a badass Bonesian. <laughs> they, they used to grow quail and Oh. is turned on to all things sustainable and um and so yeah do you mean in a bigger picture sense in a bigger picture yeah and i, I still have quail but they're getting elderly now so i've got a i've got a <laughs> quail nursing home really <laughs> oh, there, there's a role santa you can go work with sarah and marcus on their happiness by the acre farm and introduce their chickens and ducks to quail <laughs> Okay. Awesome. So um, if anyone has any, maybe just like one last question, feel free to uh, let us know. Um, if not, I would just like to say thank you everyone for coming. Um, we're going to post this on our YouTube channel. Um, with all of our other education stuff that we've done. Um, and that'll just be music of YWC Growers on YouTube. Um, and then just look for a playlist that just says um, YWC Growers Education. This will be tucked in amongst there. We do have another one coming up in two weeks. It is with Rosemary from Poplar Bluff Organics. And she is such a cool lady. So she is actually a soil, I'm gonna call her a soil scientist. I think it's a soil geneticist. Mm -hmm. um, but Barbara, if you want to talk soil, come chat off Rosemary's ear um, because she knows everything um, soil. Will there be a recording? Yeah, so I will also email it out to everyone here, um, but it will also just be on YouTube. So. And Lindsay, did you get the spelling for Reginaldo's name? Just want to make sure that uh, that got through. Yeah, cool. He's he's incredible. YouTube him, like just listen to everything he's got. Oh yeah, and as a plug, so this is the last education session that I'm going to be hosting. So from here on out, we're going to have Rob hosting them. So again, you want to see that that flow um, <laughs> and him go all L'Oreal on you? Um, feel free to tune in every Saturday Friday um, as you around Southern Alberta. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thanks everyone for coming and uh, we will hopefully see you in a couple weeks.